Okay, I've got a little odd thing that I've started to do recently. The earbuds. I'm making them out of critter clay, but I'm pulling them out of molds that I made. This mold is a silicone mold made with 100% um, pure silicone caulking and water. And I made a mold of the original and I pressed critter clay into the mold, which you can do with critter clay because of the body of the product, it's so solid. Now I'm going to pop out the frozen earbuds and I'm going to put them in the fridge overnight. And here we have a frozen clay earbud. See the alert position. Uh, this part here the uh, flashing can be cut off. Better to do it as it thaws. Oh, there we go. Then you scrape the excess away. Um, nice thing about this, I used it on a large, this is a, a medium set of earbuds. I used it on a large deer and I'm going to use it on the little uh, velvet antler deer. Okay. Um, the reason I'm going with this method is rather than use the actual earbuds that are made out of flexible foam, they're beautifully made and they're wonderfully flexible, but there's no longer any uniformity in the way uh, head forms are sculpted. It was a time that they were all sculpted with the back of the form completely rounded off okay like the back of the head now everyone is putting their own signature to it they're putting in partial ear butts and whatnot and in order to use the original uh, foam ear butts you either have to heat this up which can cause melting or you know terrible toxic fumes or cut off the back of the uh, head form and round it out that's just a lot of messy work that I choose not to bother with. So I made a quick mold of these things. I've already used a set in one deer and I'll show you his ear butts. And I'm going to use this in the little um, a little velvet antler deer. And it's nice thing about the clay is that letting it melt, uh, letting it thaw overnight in a refrigerator will soften it up enough to be able to put paste in here and adhere the the ear liner to the earbud, the clay earbud, and then be able to actually flex the clay around the base of the of the ear liner. And I could actually I could press this in further if I want to, or I can carve some of it out so that it makes a nice tight seating. But this is what I'm looking for right here. This just about it right there. Okay. And I say the left and the right were made. They put the clay is pushed into the mold. The molds are bagged, put into this tub, and then put into the freezer, frozen solid. When I pull them out of the mold, I put them in the plastic, and put them in the refrigerator overnight. Okay, this large buck, and this is a large buck, this large buck had the same medium clay ear liners made for him and they were added to in order to increase the size for this particular deer but it, it still it gave me a very nice base to work with a very nice base to work with and you can see the detail as was shown in the references you can see the the little ball at the back of the uh, cartilage ear liner and how the structure runs along the back of the ear and it gives me a nice fill in around and you can see the the wrinkles modeled into the front and how it comes right up to the base of the antlers here so it produces the the medium clay earbuds produce earbuds for large medium 
and fairly small deer. Small deer you cut them down, large deer you simply add to them. But it's a nice base to work, work off. Okay, here are the clay earbuds that were uh, shown frozen in the mold. Uh, I did take them out of the mold, frozen, and put them in the plastic bags and put them in the refrigerator for a couple of days so they could thaw. Problem is, when they thawed, they became very, very, very loose. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave them out for maybe about a half hour or so, maybe an hour. Uh, I don't know, 45 minutes. Just to have them firm up just a little bit. I need the clay to dry out some so I can install them in the deer's ears. Once, once they firm up a bit, we'll get them in the ears, we'll get this project started, get this deer mounted. Alrighty, I'm going to take down this corner. I took it down on the other side, and it's nice and round. I'm going to take this corner down as well. Uh, what I used was this big farrier's rasp, but not the rough side. I used the smoother of the two sides. I go gentle because I don't want to knock off any of the um, mache. So it's going to do two things. It's going to round off the back of the head where I like it, which is good for the earbuds to attach to. It's also going to make it smoother to pull the cape over the form without that little corner sticking out and catching the cape as it comes over. I also evened off the back of this skull plate just a little bit. Done and done. Now it's nice and rounded and smooth. To seal it, there was a time I used to use shellac, but now I'm simply going to use Pro One Premium Hide Paste to seal where it's been filed and the internal foam has been exposed. I'll do it on both sides. And I'm simply going to let this air dry. I'm going to let this air dry. The cape will slide right over that when I, re when I apply more paste to it for the mounting, the mounting steps. And there we go. To prep the nose before mounting, I take a bowl of clay, I'm going to flatten it out and apply it over the area where the nose pad is located. Now even though the nose area on these forms are nice and rounded, this clay is just going to make it just a little bit softer looking and if I want to roll the skin along here anywhere, it's going to have a soft underlayer to guide its positioning and rolling. I'm going to press that ball of clay very, very thin. It's not thick. It's going to be very, very thin. Now I'm going to apply it like so. Make it fairly even, symmetrical. Put the whole thing over, press it into place, like so. Press it into the nostrils, over the top. Now, I'm going to take my modeling tools, my wood modeling tools, I'm going to carve away the part that's into the nostrils. like so, put it back in the clay box, smooth it, trim it, 
and press it down into tight contact with the top of the head form. I don't want a big bulging nose, so I want this pressed down. And I'm going to trim away some more clay. Like so. And trim it away. Trim it away. Trim out the nostril area. I want to keep it here over the wings of the nostrils. You want clay on the wings of the nostrils. I want it back here. Like so. Now I'm going to take a little roller. I'm going to roll the clay flat. I'm going to flatten it out with the roller. This does work better than smearing with the fingers. The pressure is a little more even than with the fingers. Got to make sure it's even all around. I'm going to trim it just a wee bit more. Smooth it, blend it to the head form, remove where I do not want any clay. Like so. And pass in front here. Now the Frenchman is out to lunch right now tonight. There we go. And here we go. And then as they say is that. I'm going to coat this with hide paste. With some hide paste. Coat this. Coat it right onto the foam. Okay. Like so. And I'm going to let this sit and dry, air dry on the clay. The next we see anything being done with the nose, the cape is going to be mounted over the form. The last thing I do before pulling the cape onto the form, I put a little bit of clay at the rear corner of the mouth. That's it. That's it. I'm going to roll out a clay. worm of clay, like so, and I'm going to I'm going to construct the corners of the mouth. This is probably like one of the last bits of clay I apply to the head form. It just lets me get a smoother lip line after the lips are tucked and I then blend this clay work into the mannequin from without the skin and then with the skin. It's not a lot but it's just enough to give the mouth a little bit of definition at the rear corner. I hope you can see that. And here we have it. I do the same work on both sides. Clean it up, out of, clean it up out of the details of the face. I don't want to obstruct 
the structure that's been carved out, sculpted into the face. So I make sure I get it out of the out of the muscle structure, like so. And there we go. And here we go. So it begins. I've got my big old tub of Pro One Premium Hide Paste and I'm going to start applying it to the head form. I start with the face first. The nice thing about letting the eyes set under the plastic after being coated with the paste is that you can run your hands over the clay now the clay will still allow me to press in the upper lid detail even though it has been sitting oh I think it's been sitting probably now for about three or four days the cape has been refrigerated Uh, I ran into the weekend and I really don't work on the weekend. No reason I should. Lots of other people who work during the week take the weekends off. So they were under here. Now I did check them. I did give a little spritz of water with a little atomizer bottle. Uh, you saw when I did the clay on the nose. So that was done during that time that the eyes were hydrated just a bit, just with a little mist of water. But I'm going to go around. I'm putting clay on the area of the back of the head form that I filed the little pointed corners off of. I'm getting the paste all over and under the head form, around all the details, making sure paste gets pressed up into the lip slots like so my gosh this is a small deer I'm just looking at the size of my hands against his his widow head and his head is so widow <laughs> all right now I'm going to get paste around this side I want a nice even layer I don't need it you do really don't need it heavy and the nice thing about this, when you pull the cape on, unlike the dextrin paste, it doesn't get pulled away. Now I'm trying to avoid where the incision is located. I'm gonna, I'll get paste in there later. It's not a very long incision, but I do want that to be kept clear of paste before the uh, cape application. And I'm gonna go on applying paste the next thing will be to pull the cape onto the head form. The head form has been completely pasted up. Now I'm getting the cape, shaking it out a little bit. Don't forget the ear liners are in here, so I want to be aware of where the cape is at. I've got my inside and outside, or I should say, I'm sorry, my top and my bottom where it's located. All right. Here's the cape, and I'm putting it over my hands, and turning it inside out to apply to the head form, and like so, over we go. Now, just be sure the back of the form, of the cape rather, is going down the back of the head form, now it's not twisted. It's been, it was fitted over the form once while it was dry. It got a dry fitting. I always do a dry fitting. It does two things. One, it lets me know where the features, the details are going to end up. And two, it stretches the cape out so that when I'm finally at the mounting stage, like here, it will go on without any difficulty. Now, Small as he is, he does fit the form a little tight, 
But the nice thing about having the eyes pre-made, preset, with the hardened clay, well not hardened, but the semi-dried clay, a lot of the moisture is out of the clay, is that this cape pressing down on the eyes is not going to disturb all of my careful clay work. And remember, there was a whole video devoted to the clay work. So, you know, we don't want to ruin that. And let's get him here like so. Now I'm going to get my stout rougher, excuse me. And I like to use this. I don't use this for roughing up forms as much as I use this to pull the cape onto the head form. Like so. Put it down. Get back here. My fingers under the cape, at the eyes, at the top of the head. Wipe the paste off my fingers. I've not put the clay uh, earbuds in place yet. They're going to go on. They're going to go in to the skin after I get him placed on the head form. And once we pass, there, there's always one critical point on getting the cape onto the form. Once you pass it, you'll know it because suddenly everything slides into place. Everything slides into place beautifully. And I say, this is a, such a small buck, but he's a little beauty. He's pretty clean. He doesn't have a lot of scars. He has a little bit of epidermal slippage around the eyelids, which can happen from time to time for whatever reason. Uh, the fact that this little buck, killed in October, still has velvet on his antlers indicates, oh, several things. He's either what's called, I believe it's called a cryptorchid. It's cryptorchidic in that he has like one descended testicle or his testicles were damaged by a kick or some other damage or poor genetics, or he was a little sick. And if he was a little sick, that would keep velvet in place and make his skin just a wee bit tender. Okay, now I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to reapply a little bit of paste to the tip of the nose. Pardonnez-moi. Ah, the Frenchman's back. Just a wee bit. Just a wee bit. Oh, now my... My little Irish leprechaun friend is here. Okay. No offense meant to anybody. I could say he's a little guinea and offend everybody all the way around, and that would be me. I'm a guinea anyway, so I don't care. Okay. They're just words, folks. Just words. And I'm not using them in a hateful manner. I'm using them in a comedic vein, which I guess I'm from the Mel Brooks School of Comedy. Hmm. Oh, well. Okay. I love it when a deer head comes together. I love it when a deer head comes together. Now before I go much further on him, I'm going to go ahead and prep the ears to accept the clay earbuds. All right, I've got the, now the ear liners on the inside of the ear because I left them exposed to the air are dried and secured to these ear liners. And what I've done is I've pulled the skin down around the base of the ear liners. And I'm going to take one of the clay ear butts. This is for the left side, as you can see. I'm going to go ahead. It's been sitting for a couple of hours now. I left it a little longer than I was originally planning to. And I'm going to situate the ear liners in place in the ear butts. Now, I did pre-fit these ear butts to uh, another set of plastic ear liners. Now, even though the out, outer dimensions of the ear liners across the front and around the perimeter have been altered to make a smaller deer, the ear butt size, the, the base of the ear cartilage itself, remains the same. Now, what I'm doing right now, I'm smoothing this clay onto the ear liners. I'm bringing it into close contact with the ear liners. I don't want any gaps. 
any places that require it I'm going to add a little bit of clay just a wee bit of clay where the ear liners meet the ear butts I hope you could see this let's get it over here alrighty right here I want to get some fresher clay a little roll of fresher clay I'm going to roll it out roll out a little worm again and I'm going to make a connection right along where the ear liners meet the ear butts and I'm going to blend the entire structure together okay now I'm going to take a little bit of paste I'm going to paste up the clay of the ear butt because clay will not stick to the skin it is not an adhesive I'm going to take the ear paste all around the clay be sure I have it everywhere it's supposed to be everywhere there will make skin making contact the hide making contact with the ears the ear butts I should say and I'll also put it on the inside of the ear skins just a bit there we are now we'll turn the entire thing right side out alrighty make sure it's that the ear butt is pushed up into the ear skin it's proper locale well, I may have to get my big head in the way a little bit to get a good look at what's happening here. Now, see, that's why I wanted paste inside on the clay to help adjust this into place. There, now. Very nice. Very, 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 very nice. Now, off camera, I'm going to set the other ear, the other ear base, and when I come back, the other ear will have its ear butt in place, and the antlers will be attached to the top of the head form. And as with every step through this entire process of working with these potentially delicate velvet antlers, the skull plate is being screwed in by hand. Oh boy. Fun? No. Careful? You betcha. Will I do it again in another instance like this? In a New York minute, baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to continue on screwing the antlers in, getting them down tight, and then I'll be pulling the ears up in place and continuing on with the mounting of the little deer with the skull plate with the skull plate secured and the screw heads down tight against the bone where they belong I simply fill over the open holes with some fresh critter clay all four get sealed in the same way making sure that this smoothed over and the clay actually blends into the top of the skull plate well um, to the top of the mache work okay now I want to bring the ear liners well bring the ears rather and the ear butts up into place this paste is very 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 slick I can tell you that which is great for mounting not so great for trying to grab hold of the skin but it works it works I get these earbuds into place up where they belong be sure the eye eyelid skins are being located properly
like so. I need to get this on both sides now. I need to make sure that the skin comes around the backs of the earbuds so that it will close when sewn shut. Okay, right here I've got to make an adjustment of the clay on the inside at the top of the ear. I've got to make an adjustment through the outside here. Just got to press it and sculpt it around with my thumb. There we go. I need it to lay smooth and flat. There's a wrinkle right here. There's a fold actually where the clay is sitting where it wants to and I want it to be where I want it. So a little manipulating is required and that's done. Now I'm going to get some pins. I'm going to pin things in place just temporarily. I'm going to go around back here and we'll pin this skin into the form at the back and manipulate this where I want it. Now I need to use a couple of long probes a couple of upholstery probes get this skin up under the antler burr and then get this skin taxied into place around the earbuds like so press down with my finger and make it all tight contact now to set the direction of the ears proper in their seating in the earbuds More of this adjustment will be done later, after he's sewn up. But for now, I want to get this in its proper location. Uh, location is everything. Location, 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 location. And I want to get the skin oriented by brushing that little seam I spoke about in my reference section. And get this meeting of the rear and front hairs meeting like so and there's a, this going down a little a little bit much it's going a little lower than i want well over the next few days this will be worked and pushed up and repositioned into its proper place so here we've got the little buck coming together real nice now I'm going to go to the other side and do his other ear, and I'm going to prepare to tuck the lips and get him sewn up. Before I do anything else, I want to get in here with the hide paste and get it up around the underside of the antler burr and also on the cape that's going to go around the antler burr. This way it's glued tight. It will stay glued into position around the antlers. Gears on both sides. You've got two antlers normally. <laughs> and you want that done on both sides. Now you don't need a big heavy glop of hide paste. Just enough to coat everything. It will go around down the sides, around the antlers, as long as it's up under the base. That's the main thing, up under the burrs of the antlers and onto the hide. I got to get around and get the other side. There, now the top of his toupee can go down, kind of what it looks like, and situate into place. And there. Now, the live deer did have all of this hair coming up around the base of his antlers. And I'm glad it turned out that way because that's the way he was when he was brought in. I was going to say in life, but he didn't come to me alive, so I can only assume that's what he was like 
in life. And you know what happens when you ask um? I don't want to talk about it. I ask um too many. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to bag this head, bag the face, before I worry about tucking the lips or anything like that. I don't want the face skin to dry out, so I'm going to bag the face so I can begin sewing up the incision across the top and getting the ears in their final position. Okay, to close this guy up, I've got him tipped over towards me, okay? Um, it's at an angle which is easier for my back. Um, now, after having the hide paste placed around uh, the head and whatnot on the top of the uh, mache, I like to bring the skin up around as tight as possible and I use the pliers to bring it along. After that's done, I like to take the clay that's part of the ear base and blend it onto the top of the head, much in the way, natural way, much in the natural way that the, the, the actual muscles of the deer's ear butts attached to the top of its head. I'm going to reach under there and I'm going to put a little bit of paste on the clay just so that the skin will taxi, will slide around. A little more paste here. There we go. That's great. Right there. Okay. Now, let me get my needle and thread. I have already have this double waxed thread attached to a fine needle. And you can see how small the needle is here. Okay. Three-cornered needle. It will cut through the skin where I want it. First thing I'm going to do is go in. Now we have a little bit of a cut here around the area the needle needs to go through, so I want to be careful that I don't tear that rip. That will be fixed in place with the hide paste and I can get a small hide nail over there later on while it's being set up. One of the toughest things to do is get the needle in the right place to start. All right. Now, to make sure that the knot does not get pulled through, I go through to a double, double strand of thread. I go like so, pull it down, then I grab one side of the thread over the other, pull, and that will bring the knot to the underside of the hide. It will not show from the top. Now I'm going to get in here. I'm going to push the needle through. Now this is just going to be a simple back and forth, a simple baseball stitch at this point. I get my probe and be sure the skin is shoved under the ear butt where it's supposed to be, like so. Now I'm going to bring this around. It will come together. This will come together. I like to go a little ahead of where the incision started just to make sure I take up any stretch that has occurred during the shaving process in, uh, at the tannery. I'm going to hold down the skin here and push through. It's a little tough. There's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a younger deer, but he has got some tough hide. No doubt about it. Sometimes it helps if you use a long nose pliers to help bring the needle along. Now again, I'm going to bring that down. I'm going to bring these two ends together here. I want to watch now. I don't want to pull until the, uh, I don't want the thread to snap through the skin. 
But right here, right here, you can see that the skin has been drawn together at that point. Right there. I'm going to continue on. After the needles push through, I hold the skin down with one finger, pull up on the needle with the other hand. This way the skin doesn't keep rising and pulling the stitches apart from themselves. Now I draw them together carefully, like so. Now where this skin is exposed here, I'm going to push that under the antler burr and to do that I'm going to use not the probe this time I don't want to go through the skin I'm just going to grab one of my big modeling tools and model the skin where I want it to be I want the skin under the antler burr I want this little piece of hide under the antler burr I want this hide here pressed down flat against itself now remember now the hide paste is in there Okay, the hide paste is going to help hold everything in place. This really, this really is a fantastic paste in that it does, it does a real, it does a real journeyman's job of holding the skin down. Now I'm going to hold the skin down tight against the top of the mache when I put the needle through. I don't want the skin pulling the stitches open. Again, holding it down as I pull the needle from the other side, like so. Make sure the hairs are pulled out of the stitches on both sides. There we go. Again, I'm going to come underneath, hold the skin down here, like so, and push it through. Now, this is a very sharp needle. If the needles are dull, I put this leather finger guard over my middle finger and I, that helps me push the needle, the needle through the skin. Because like I say, this is a brand new nice sharp needle so it goes right through the skin. And the skin is shaved very evenly up here. A little on the thin side but very very evenly. Uh, the Wildlife Gallery does a real real good job along the seams. Now, that will not show when it's completed. I'm just simply storing the finger cot, the leather finger cot on the brow time. And we go through again. Now, as I said, the top is closed with the baseball stitch. The main body of the incision, from the back of the V down the back of the deer's neck incision, is done with the upholsterer's or hidden stitch. And I have a video on YouTube that demonstrates that. I will do it here for this deer. This deer has a little shorter hair than the one originally demonstrated on. Now, what I'm, do what I'm doing is I'm grabbing the two sides of the incision between my forefinger and thumb and holding the skin as I pull the threads taut. I can feel the skin coming together. And I only bring it together just so much and no more. This way it won't tear. Go through again. These stitches are only about ooh, an eighth of an inch apart maybe. Sometimes, if the situation warrants, they're a sixteenth of ouch, a sixteenth of an inch apart. Okay, didn't go quite through the fingernail that time, but I have driven the needle through the top of my fingernail, and I'll tell you, you want to talk about a pain that hurts like hell? That's a pain that hurts like hell. Again, bring the two ends of the skin together, all right, like so, between the finger and the forefinger and thumb. Draw on the thread. You feel the skin drawing together. And you see this is what it looks like on the underside. Right there. OK. 
Okay? Not bad. What I'm going to do, I want to pull the hair out of these stitches. I don't want the hair sticking down through the stitches. There we go. It's wonderful, wonderful. All right. Hey, music's a big part of my life, all kinds of music. Classic rock, 70s rock, feel-good music, pop rock. No country or western. I don't like either one of those. Classical music from time to time, if I really want to relax, I'll put some classical on. But I've always got music playing in my head. I have what I call a radio head. Go figure. All right, now this last stitch will also be the knot that closes it off. And to do that, pull all the hairs out of the stitch, come around, and instead of just tightening down, I put the needle up through that last stitch, like so. And before I tighten it down, I put my fingers on either side of the incision again. I pull it tight. Now I pull the loop closed and then go through the loop again for a second time to close the loop. And before I pull that loop tight, I pull the first loop down. I got to get this. I've got to get this end corner of the skin to be on the inside. So I'll get in there with my probe tool and whoop, put it on the inside where it belongs. Otherwise, you'll have a little piece of flesh side of the skin showing, and you don't you don't want that. Now I'm going to pull this down tight. So that the loop on the loop closes and now I close the last loop on the loop and I'm going to pick the stitches out of the other uh, hair out of the stitches there we go and there we are nicely closed now I'm going to cut this off I'm going to cut the thread off the wire. It would be good to know what I'm cutting off. Open them up. Open up the double strands. Pull them tight. And simply make just a regular little knot. I don't know if this is a square knot or whatever this is. I just knot it off. Pull it down tight, like so. I don't cut these two ends off. I leave them long and they get tucked up under the skin and pushed into the clay of the ear base. Now I'll start the other side. And when I get back, we'll start down the back incision of the deer. All right, to begin the upholsterer's or hidden stitch, I've come down through the top side opposite the end of the, of the seam at the top here. I've come to the top and down. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to come over, go down through the top of the opposite side. All right. Now this is a stitch where you have to be aware of the, the hair being pulled through, especially when the thread gets a little gnarly from um, having hide paste on it. Okay, we're down through the top. On the same side, we go up through the flush side as close as we can to where the stitch went in. Now we're going to cross over I'm going to cross over the top, like so, to the opposite side. I'm going to grab the skin here. My fingers are going to be in the way for a minute, but I'm going to grab the skin on this side 
Maybe I can use a pliers. Just to hold the skin so my big fat fingers don't get in the way. A little silver tip of a pliers. Here we go. We go down through the top on the opposite side, like so. Pull the needle, pull the needle through. Back the thread out to pull the hairs back out. Now I'm going to have to pick these out. Pick, I'm picking out the hairs. I see these. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I'm picking out the hairs that, that came through. Okay. Now, on the side we just came down on, I'm going to go up through the flesh side like so. Pull the skin. Ah, uh, pull the thread. I'm going to bring these first two stitches together. And they are now pulling the skin down upon itself. Oh, I've got to get this piece of thread out of here. This is the thread that was hanging from the first stitches that were closed. I just want to get them out of the way. There we go. Put them under and out of the way. Okay. Let's see if we can show this. I don't know how well the camera's picking it up. Right there. Right here. This, the incision is being drawn in on itself, down on the left and on the right, onto itself, closing the seam. I'm going to repeat a couple more stitches, then I'm going to have to change this thread out because it's a little too short. I underestimated the length of the incision with this piece of thread, which was left over from the previous mounted deer head. Being sure I keep the hairs from being pulled down into the stitch from the top. We go down and we come up through the flesh side on the same side of the incision. We're going to cross over again. There we are. Cross over to this side, to the right side down through the top of the right side, down through the top of the right side, holding the hairs back out of the way. There, I didn't, only pulled one or two. That's good, that's good. Okay, now up through the flesh side on the right, same side we came down on. Now again, over to the left and go down through the top of the incision on the left. Ah, I've got a lot of clay and whatnot built up on this needle. I'm going to have to clean the shaft of this needle off. Pick the hairs out of the, out of the threads as we go. Now I'm going to go up through the flesh side on the left side of the incision. Put my finger under the incision, draw it down on itself. Between the thumb and forefinger again, just as I did earlier. And here you can see the incision coming down on itself, right there. Right there. Can't make it any plainer. This side comes down, the right side comes down, the left side comes down. They join on themselves in between, hidden beneath the surface. Thus, the invisible, hidden, upholsterer's stitch. That's how it's done. I will continue that for the entire length. I have to thread this off right now. I mean, I have to tie off this... <laughs> I have to tie off this thread right now so I can cut a new thread to go further down the incision. And I need to clean off all of this nasty gook
off my needle. See how it's coated? One part is nice. The back part of the needle is all nasty. I'll be back. This is the thread I use. Purchased from Joe Combs. He still supplies it. It's a nice, heavy, pre-waxed cotton polyester thread. I can use it single for, cutting, uh, for closing cuts and bullet holes and arrow holes. And of course, I double it over for my regular stitching projects. Alrighty, I've got my needle all cleaned, scraped it down with a cartilage knife, went over it with some fine wet dry sandpaper, so it's all clean. Let's get back to sewing. The thread that I had to cut off yesterday because it was too short has been tucked under the incision and pressed down into the clay for the earbuds. I'm going to start by going up right alongside the former stitches I want to go up to start the reason I'm going up to start is because when I pull this knot down tight I want it to be on the underside the only way to be on the underside is to come up from underneath so let me get the hairs out of the way. I've looped through the doubled thread at the base of the knot. I'm going to pull my thread through, pull down to shorten up, grab one side of the thread, pull, and you see the knot going underneath. Now I pull on both. With that done, I'm going to go over to the other side and pull these threads down from the previous stitching. And I'm going to go in through the top right next to the previous stitches. Pull the thread down on the right. Pull the old threads in. See how they disappear? I hope you can see how they disappeared. Now I'm going to come up through the flesh side on the right. I'm going to cross over to the left side of the incision. Go down through the hair side, through the top. Like so. Keep the threads out of the stitches as I go. I keep the hair out of the stitches as I go, not the threads. The hair. Keep the hair out of the stitches as I go. Now I'm going to come up through the flesh side on the left, like so. Let me untangle this thread from the previous stitching. Here we go. Cross over to the right side once again, down through the hair side, like so, down through the hair side. Through the flesh side on the right, I'm 
cross over to the left one more time, down through the hair side on the left, I want to keep my threads untangled from themselves and from anything else. With my finger I'm moving the hairs out of the way. I don't want them to get pulled into the stitching on both sides. The hairs out of the way. Up through the flesh side on the left. Now I have these several stitches, I don't know, two, three, four stitches. <clears throat> Put my finger under the incision, pull it taut. Like so. And there we have the hidden or invisible or upholsterer's stitch. Now I've got this entire length to accomplish all the way down to here. I'm going to, I'm going to continue on off camera because I'm in a position where I'm reaching over the deer instead of being behind it and that's a little uncomfortable. So I'll be back. I'd like to demonstrate some, one, little, one little thing. Um, you saw how the threads were you know coming away from each other and just really interfering with themselves and catching hair. Let me demonstrate how I wax thread. This is a little cake of beeswax. I got this actually from a place that was selling honey. The way you wax the double threads is you get them in the wax and go over them for the like this back and forth. Go all around the double threads for the entire length of the thread all the way down to your needle. Okay? Now, once that's done, the warmth from your fingers will, as you can hear, will sort of melt the wax onto the threads, removing any of the excess little bits that were in place. So now what we've got is a nice heavy line of double thread. Like so. This will keep from getting in its own way. It was actually getting in its own way. And you see how nice it will pass through the hide as well. Not catching I say the, the thread is pre-waxed to begin with, but if you wax it after doubling it over, you can pull your hairs out of the stitch and a little easier to control the hair is not being pulled through. Like so. You come up. It also allows the thread to pull through the skin much smoother. You see how it's not coming apart on itself like it was before. I really should have waxed the thread before I started, but now you see how the simple, the simple process of waxing the thread is done. You always read, you should wax your thread, that's how to do it. Okay, I've stitched all the way down to the bottom. I'm about to close it off. The last loop will create the knot. I put the little needle through the last loop and I pull from, well I pull like so, yeah, hold the loop up, clear the hairs, pull down on the loop, like so. Now I'm going to pull this down. Like so. I'm going to cut the thread a 
cut off just enough. All about like so. I'll put a knot in the end of the thread left attached to the needle. And that will <clears throat> start the stitching on the next ear at the antlers. I'm going to take this thread, unwrap it from itself, make a square knot, another square knot. Now I take the threads, put them back together. Get a six inch needle, six inch long sewing needle, three cornered needle. Thread the thread through the eye of the needle. Find where the, I like to do it after I find where the threads tied together go in where the last knot was located, right through the skin, come through the skin, and out the skin further down from the incision. You can see the needle is right here. Okay, now let's put that thread back through the eye of the needle again. like so. Now keeping the threads out of the way, out of the path of the needle, pull the large needle through and all the way out the other side. So the thread is now down here. Pull this tight, pull it taut. Now let this, let the skin right up the thread Cut it without, without cutting the hairs. And now with a probe, bring the skin down, taxi it all back into place. And we straighten out the incision area. Start tamping it flat. What I have here is some of the Pro One Premium Hide Paste and a little water. As per the instruction sheet that came with it, I'm going to make, oh, sort of a hair setting gel. But this is a little better than hair setting, regular hair setting gel. This will get down and really tame any hairs that might want to stick up. The nice thing about it is being a water-based paste it will brush out when dry. Now what I have to do here, the problem I'm having here, I need to taxi the skin forward just a bit. Let me get my stout rougher here and bring this cape up the neck just a bit. Just like so. Just like so. The nice thing is the paste underneath allows this to slide around. You want to make sure it gets down tight behind the ear butts. And now I'm going to work this paste, this hair setting paste, down into the little errant hairs that want to stick up. Straighten out the incision a bit. 
Make sure it's running straight up and down the back. Like so. Press it into the clay of the ear butts. Now down we go. And we do this all around this back area here. There we go. Nice thing is it does not have a uh, a scent of its own the way uh, regular hair setting gel does. A hide paste really has no aroma. So it's not going to leave an unpleasant smell behind. I'm going to brush this into the hair. And what I do in all cases, I take a strip of, during the tacking down of the back to the, the, the skin to the backboard, I take a strip of the plastic counted cross stitch canvas and I tack a strip down the back of the incision from the top of the head down. That will hold everything in place till she dries. And after it dries, after it dries, it's not going to lift away even after brushing out. Like so. That's good for now. And what I'm going to start doing is shaping the clay at the back of the ear butts, getting my anatomy put in place. You've got that muscle at the back that comes along. Get my references, my 3D references. And I'm looking to recreate right here. I'm going to do that. Just simply press in with my finger. Or I could use one of my modeling tools. Go along like so. And I just simply start modeling. The clay is still soft enough underneath. Here's the bulb of the cartilage located right here, as seen on this, on this 3D reference piece. And just simply keep manipulating the clay until I have all, see, and as I'm, as I'm moving it, I'm pushing it up a bit too, so that it sits higher on the head where it belongs. They don't sit as high on the head as, as a moose. We're talking about a white-tailed deer here. Once that's done, give you a little brush. Brush the hair patterns. And then you can see how correct the anatomy is becoming. The, little, the bulb of the back of the cartilage is right here. Muscle structure is coming along here. Press this flat across the top, like so. The hair starts coming down at an angle. It doesn't come straight back. It comes down at an angle. And more of that will take place during the actual uh, final grooming. I still have to set the eyes, nose, tuck the lips, and whatnot. 
But this is just some basic structure formation here that I want to get to before she starts to have a chance to dry up. Don't forget, after, after freezing, that clay came out real wet once it was thawed. So, you know, it's real, real workable and real sculptable. And that's one of the most important things, is to be able to sculpt your details into your deer. Get them as symmetrical as you possibly can. Both these ears are going forward, so both these ears need to have the same details showing on both sides. I'm brushing from this side of the deer and really you walk all the way around to get a proper proper grooming and sculpting. But this is the start of the detail on the back of the ears now. Onto the face. First thing to do when working on the eyes is get in there with a brush and clean them. Remember when we put the paste in over the eyes for the cape they were covered with paste. And if we get the paste off them now, while, they're, while the paste is still wet and we remove it, it's less to worry about later. Next thing I want to do, I want to take some paste. I want to put some of the paste down into location of the eyelids. I want to get paste right behind the eyelids and on the clay. Take it off the eyelashes if it gets on there. I want to get paste under the eyelids. Otherwise if there's no paste, you know, if the paste thinned, the paste thinned a little as the wet cape went on, and clay is not an adhesive, so you want this to adhere in place. I'll wipe this off just a bit, some of it, like so. Press this into contact here. Let's see, let's get this here. All right. Get this modeling tool in here. And one of the whole things is to taxi the skin into place, which means we bring it forward see it moving forward here just a bit get everything to line everything up where it needs to go we want this lacrimal gland to enter the lacrimal opening that was made in the form and shaped with clay I want to gently press contact the eye eyelids into their position on the clay, bring the skin forward a bit, we go under here, under the upper lids, make sure we're making good contact here, I want to make sure the lashes are pointing downward as they should be, a little uneven on this side here. There we go. Let's bring this skin forward a bit more. Shape it into the front crease at the eye, the front of the eye. Manipulate the skin around. Bring the feeler hairs forward a bit. 
we can get them to stand up on a mount, so much the better. Because on a live animal, the feelers are always alert. Very rarely do you see them folded flat back against the, the skin, as seen in so many mounts that don't bother with this detail. Uh, it's stand, they're standing up beautifully now. Now let's get this lacrimal gland tucked. And for that I will use end of this modeling tool, get it into place, get it in, make sure it all goes in, follow the eye channel at the front, that lacrimal skin, you want that bare skin going in. Now the clay that was put in place will close over this, like so. And over the course of the next few days, the skin and the hair pattern will continue to be adjusted. my finger to shape it. Get in there and clean the clay and paste off the glass eye. Now, remember I said the skin will tell the story of where the eyelid crease goes. This deer is not showing a whole heck of a lot. So I want to be very, very judicious and very careful about where I place it. I don't want it to look too big. So I'm going to give them a very, very, very little, very little crease. Just right along here, like so. I can see where there's a disturbance in the, in the hair pattern. And that's it, right there. That's all this little buck has. That's all he has to show for it, right there. Like so. Now we reshape the eyelid, bring the crease down, the eyelid crease down to the front. And you want to now that gave him an angry eye from the front. Ooh, we don't want an angry eye. So we raise that a bit. And we have a nice eye happening here. Like so let me grab a brush real quick. And give him a light brushing over, just a light brushing over. Now this is a air bubble. So we'll grab a three-cornered needle, a big three-cornered needle, pop the air bubbles under the skin that are forming under the skin. A little bit of brushing. We find an air pocket, we pop it. And you can see how the details are falling deep into this front area of the uh, of the face just ahead of the eye. Now I'm going to get this hair pattern even. Bring the hair up. Give a little expression over his brow. And I'm going to continue to work on this eye a little bit. Then I'm going to go to the other side. Then we'll show the tucking of the lips and the setting of the nostrils. And here's what we have from the front. Front view, I should say. 
Besides cleaning the eyes, a wet brush can go a long way in aiding to shape the eyes, and I'll tell you why. The brush is much softer than a modeling tool. The brush can help shape the lower and upper lids without a lot of distortion, as can happen if you're not careful with a stainless steel or a wooden modeling tool. Now, as the skin dries, it will pull down tighter to the clay that's been shaped, and you will get a more refined shape. But for right now, this is pretty good. For a wet, a wet head, this is really, really a nicely shaped eye. Now, I'll see if I can't darken in these little epidermal slippage areas so you get a, a more clear version, uh, a, a more clear view, I should say, of what exactly it is I have going on here. Now here is the eye from the front after a little fine tuning and uh, just a little burnt umber oil paint to kind of blend everything together to give it a cleaner image than before. And here is the eye in profile. Again, a lot of fine tuning and a little bit of burnt umber color added just to kind of tone it all together so you have a better way to look at it. Okay, one of the things I do in order to bring these feeler hairs forward, besides using just a modeling tool, I like to get in down at their roots with a needle and actually bring them forward by the roots. I don't recommend yanking on them or tugging, even gently, because even a gentle forward yank on the hairs can take can tear them out of the sockets. Don't forget, we thin these skins down a lot, a lot. Now, over the course of the first three or four days, this will need to be repeated because as the skin dries, it will have a tendency to pull them down. Now, you want to bring the feeler here forward and up in order to get them to stand. Go in at the root, for, at the root, forward and up. You might have to adjust the skin here a little bit, but forward and up. Never grab them like this. I mean, this is easy, but they will very, very easily be yanked and pulled out of their sockets with with the littlest with the littlest um, prompting. You know what I'm saying? The smallest prompting can get them yanked out of their sockets. Okay, so here they all are. Bring them up, forward, and up, like so. And see, doesn't that look nice? Doesn't that look nice? Pretty, 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 pretty. The lower fewer hairs are handled in exactly the same way. Okay? Fewer hairs down here are handled exactly the same way. Get down there with a needle into the root, lift and forward, forward and lift. A lot of times, too, if you just press in at the root, you can get them to stand on end, just like so, just like that. Believe me, the skin will pull down and it will dry. But if you, if you need to, just feel better about it, just go over with a, a wood modeling tool. You can soften the look on the skin again. 
little tips like this will produce a most realistic deer. Okay. Leave us unwrap the face. Peel the schnozzle back over the clay. I'm going to add just a little more paste here. I want to be able to taxi the skin without any worries at all. I want the skin to move. The nice thing with this paste, very slick, allows the paste to move. Put a little bit on the inside. Just take it off my finger and I got some on my finger, so I wiped it on the skin. In and it. Okay, now I rolled out a little worm of clay, and I'm going to put that in the front of the lower lip. Press it in. Fold the skin over on itself. So, oops, let's get it in there. Need to pinch it off just a little bit. Just a little bit. There we go. Don't need a lot. In fact, this might be just a little too much. So, I'm going to take some of it out. It's just a little long. Take some of that out of, out of there. And we're going to prepare to turn the whole thing over, start tucking the lips. First thing to do, preparation for tucking the lips, is to pull the muzzle back in place, back over, put it in place. I'm going to trim out the backs of these nostrils some. I'm going to grab it with a um, hemostat just to hold it. And we're just going to trim the back of the nostril skin. Like so. You see, it actually took that much off. It's quite a bit. Does not need to be there. And we'll trim a little bit of this away here, heading towards the back of the nostril. Even it off. There we go. Like so. Now that nostril skins are trimmed, we're going to taxi the skin into place. That nice new layer of paste under the hide. Make sure everything lines up in a proper place. Nostril wings, edges of the nostrils on both sides, the left and the right. Just want to get everything lined up in its proper place. Make sure the skin has got plenty of stretch in these details. Make sure the hair patterns match up. There's this dark center stripe on him. It goes up the center. Let's pull this back here. All right. Now, adjust that hide a little more. Turn him upside down. Let's see. First, I'm going to add just a little more paste in here. I'm just chewing his cud. Little cud chewer. All right. Now we turn them over. Now that it's upside down on the mounting stand, first thing you need to do is taxi the skin around just a little bit. 
want to make sure you work out any unwanted wrinkles, unnatural wrinkles, so that we can line everything up. I'm going to take my lip tucking tool, start tucking the lips. I'm going to start at the front. First thing I want to do Well, I think first thing I want to do, very first thing, is put just a little bit of clay into the lip slot. This is going into the front of the lip slot itself. Like so. Into the lip slot. and a little bit of paste I'm going to add some paste for taste we get the skin lined up make sure the center of the nose pad which is here is in this, located at the center of the lip slot. I'm going to take my shortened lip tucking tool and start by tucking that in. I'm going to go along toward the back, work my way toward the back. I'm going to stop about halfway. Now what you want to do, you want to get the inner lips tucked until you come up to the hairline, okay? Now you want to find the corner of the mouth, bring that to the corner on the lip slot, tuck the corner of the mouth in. And now you want to work the skin forward. Off excess hide paste. Bring the lip skin all together. See, after skinning and after tanning, as, within, as with many mammals, the skins tend to let out. And a deer cape will do the same. A deer cape will let out. And I'm going to use my longer lip tucking tool. Like so. Now the top lip is tucked. just like so. I'm going to do the opposite side and when I'm done I'm going to come back and tuck the lower lips. Okay, and I'm going to come to, with the lower lips, I'm going to come to the front. Try and maintain that clay in the lip. Begin by bringing the lower jaw skin forward. I'm going to tuck the front lips first. I tuck the front lip skin first. What I want to do is straighten it out. I want to get my hair patterns straight, flatten out the skin, work out any undue wrinkles that can cause a problem. And we're going to get in there, I think
think with a modeling tool. Yeah. A smaller modeling tool. I'm going to get in here and get this lip skin and start carefully tucking it down. This is the inner lip skin. I'm getting in and I'm pushing it into the lip slot. Now we go back to the half length lip tucker. And we start tucking the heavier front lip skin. Now working along the sides. Really, I'm, I'm working the lip skin into the slot, sort of walking it in. Now, that could have been trimmed a little more, but it's going in as well. You tuck one side, then the other. Make sure our markings are centered. We continue to tuck the front lip skin. I want some showing, but I don't want a lot of that lower lip skin showing. Just enough. Just enough to make a difference, but I want it held in place. Don't forget the clay is in there to help hold everything down, as well as a hide paste. Now what I'm doing is... Let me change this camera angle. I'll show you what I'm doing at the front lip. What I'm doing now, I've got the lip skin tucked. But what I'm doing now, that little bit of clay that's in there, I'm pushing from below, below the bare lip skin of the front. Push down and to actually create a lip roll. I say I don't want a lot of lower lip showing. I don't want too much showing. It probably will pull down some as well. Now remember all that soft clay that was on the nose pad? Or that I put in place on the nose pad. There's a reason for that. Right now I'm starting to model it. Well, on camera it's being modeled up, but anatomically speaking, it's being modeled down toward the front of the lower lip. Now, with this my ha favorite handy dandy little modeling tool, I'm going to take the center cleft in the nose pad and I'm going to accentuate that by pressing in. And the reason I can press in is because of the soft clay. Ha ha! See, there is method to the madness after all. Again, we roll that down. I want to create a nice, soft, rounded appearance. And then put that little cleft in the middle of the nose pad. Right there. I'm going to continue on tucking the rest of the lips. And what you're looking at is the lower lip going in from, you're looking at it from the front. Working that, that lip skin into the lip slot. Going in back at the corner. Getting all that lip skin in. I don't want any internal lip skin showing on the outside. Now. The skin behind the lips needs to be taxied back and down upon itself. Remember that clay at the corner of the mouth. This is where that clay comes into play. And I'll demonstrate that when it's back in the upright position.
All right. So now we're here. Now this is where the clay was modeled onto the rear corner of the mouth. Now, on this little particular buck, any little wrinkling of the skin in the corner of the mouth will show. So the wrinkles must be worked out. You work them out with a modeling tool. And you make sure you get the air bubbles out as well. Groom the hair. Groom the hair pattern. Now, the clay under the skin is modeled into position, manipulated around with your fingers. Use your fingers. You can see I'm creating the corner of the mouth here. It's very, very subtle. All right? It's not a big detail. It's very subtle, but it, it is there. That's the main thing. It is, in fact, there. And that clay will help to keep details in place. Now I'm moving some feeler hairs into position. Making sure I'm working out all wrinkles at the rear corner of the mouth. Don't forget, you've got a convergence of the deer's hide in this place. And there are strong details under the form at this point. Now we've got some, I've got a air pocket forming right here. Puncture that with a three-cornered needle. Press the air out. And you can see my finger bringing out the details in the face. <clears throat> Our short-haired animals such as this, some folks like to extend the detail that's, in, that's sculpted onto a mannequin, but unless the deer has got short enough hair, then doing that will be accentuating phony details. Now you recall when I, when I did the clay work, I made sure to not soften or dull the detail of the facial muscles that are, that are sculpted into the form. Now they show. I did not exaggerate them in any way. This little buck with his fine coat of, of hair and thin skin is allowing the details to show through. And the Pro One hide paste, as it dries, it has been explained, and I've been able to prove it in specimens that have been mounted with it. It will draw the skin down tight to the form doesn't matter if it's a life size or a head or what have you. And right, now it's time to situate the nostrils. Get them placed. That's what I'm working on now. I'm getting the skin into position for the next step. Now what I do, I get the modeling tool put it up under the nose skin and help bring it along into position. Then take my tech bond. I still like using super glue for this part. Put the tech bond on the tip of the modeling tool. Get the modeling tool in and apply it to the mannequin. 
and just a little bit on the skin on the inside of the nostril skin the parts I'm gluing down first like so and the underside of the top of the interior of the nostril now it's going to get placed I begin at the rear corner or the rear end of the nostril then I start working the skin in all around it's not an instant bond so you do have some time to manipulate the skin you want to get up under the upper nostril detail you want to get that skin in there you want to get the skin in at the top section you want to manipulate the hide into place around the outside of the nose get this interior nostril skin secured in its proper location and you know that by having your photo references available use them if you have them don't just collect them they're not baseball cards use them we need to bring the skin up on the nose pad we need to bring that skin up and further push the nostril skin in at this point bring the nose pad skin up higher on its location remember that soft clay in there that will help you form a nice soft round edge get up under the nostril I'm going to get the skin properly located and situated, seated in the proper place. Shape the nostril opening with your finger or modeling tool. All right, I so say we've got that pretty good right now. piece of skin that needs to be pushed down there we go we have a nice teardrop shape for the nostril I'm going to do this on the other side All right, at this point in time, I'm just going to go ahead and press the, the hide, the facial details into place. I'm going to brush the hair in the correct direction it needs to go. Now, around the antlers, there's a hair pattern. It goes from the front toward the ear, then there's like a seam as I was speaking about a little seam of hair on the earbuds there's a seam of hair right about the center of the antlers between the ear and the front of the antler bar make sure that's in position I want to get the hair all brushed into place properly I want to make sure my hair patterns are all correct check for air bubbles now this is the kind of thing that needs to be done to it several times a day for the first three or four days I do this 
Also, for the first several days, I grab a needle and I keep working the feeler hairs. Forward and up, forward and up. Same thing with the feeler hairs under the lower lid. Forward and up, forward and up. There are feeler hairs all over. We lose a lot during the flushing process. The only way not to is to do as I do with the whiskers on cats, and canids, and dogs, wolves, coyotes, that kind of thing, foxes. And that would be to pluck them, put them down on a, um, a piece of card, and label what side they go on and their location. Now, with the whiskers on a cat, or a lion, or you know, the, the, the feline animals, that makes sense. I'm sure there are some guys who do that with deer, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. Um, it's, for me, it's just as easy to go ahead and try and shave around the face carefully, not cut the roots. However, they will, they will be cut. We will lose some. But for those that remain, I like to tend to them very carefully. At this point, I'll come along and I'll resituate the lacrimal glands, make sure the skin is laying correctly. Press that clay that's, that I put underneath. Press that into place. Be sure there are no strong seams or wrinkles. One of the things to do is to bring the skin forward on the bottom at the location of the lacrimal gland. Press down the top and the clay. Come over the modeling tool. Make sure the skin is smoothed. Now at this point I'm going to put a bag over his head and suffocate him. No. I'm going to put a bag over his head to slow down the drying at least for the first day. It's just going to fit loosely over the entire head, not a big deal, right over the top of the antlers, like so. It's going to fit loose. I'm not going to lock out the air. I'm simply, as I said again, I'm simply loosely fitting the bag over the deer's head, and it will be like this for the first day or two. I mean, I will come back and work it. This is the bag that the capes come back in from the tannery. There we go. I've turned him into the little boy deer in a plastic bubble. That could be a movie, at any rate. He'll stay like this for a few hours today. I'll come back and check on him, make sure everything is going well. Repress the details into the, into the form. And then I'll go down to the back and staple the back of the skin to the backboard after it's trimmed. All right, I'm preparing to situate his brisket in place. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this damp towel, which is what his face was wrapped in for the longest while. <clears throat> and I'm going to come along and I'm going to take this damp towel. I'm just going to run it down the hair. Press it in all the details. This will help me discover any air bubbles that are hiding under the skin. 
as well as push them all out very, very easily. Okay, you can hear a little crackling going on under the skin. That's air pockets forming. Now that that's done, I'll go over the face a little bit. Now that that's done, I'm going to turn over. I'm going to apply a uh, hide paste to the brisket. Okay, here we go now with this. The nice thing about this little fellow was he was shot far enough back that there are no holes to worry about repairing as part of the mount, which is good because this short hair is not conducive to a neat looking seam as far as the repairs go. Now, let me tighten this up just a bit. Now I'm going to pull the skin forward on the brisket. Now there was no paste applied this far down before the hide was pulled in place, before the hide was put on the form. This helps keep, it, keep things a little clean. So I'm going to get some paste now. Okie dokie. It's not going to require a lot, just enough to help hold the skin and taxi it into position. And you definitely want to get it right up to the back edge, the rear edge of the form, the very edge of the form. And you don't want to go too heavy, so just a nice thin layer, okay? Just like so. It's magically delicious. No. <laughs> and I'm going to spread some of it on the hide itself. And there's plenty of it here on this portion of the chest. So I'm going to take that and apply it to the hide. Get it here. Now, plenty of it pulled back to the top edge as the skin was brought back. So there is plenty of hide paste here. And just get a little more. I'll just spread around what's there and maybe put a little, a little tiny glop add to it to ensure we've got enough there. That's it. Now that's it. And that's all she wrote. That's all it needs. Now I'm going to pull the skin into position and then taxi it into place. And by that I mean I'm going to pull the hide back up into place. then taxi it, move it into position. Now into position here means I want to bring the armpits to their proper location and I want to bring the skin forward a little so I'm going to put my hands on either side of the chest piece and draw it forward just a bit like so. Now you want to be careful because you don't you don't want to over bring it, you don't want to over taxi it too far forward otherwise you'll end up with you know disturbances in the force no in the hide and it will show especially on this short hair guy but I do want enough uh, armpit skin in the brisket I want enough of the brisket pattern to show now quite often many taxidermists fail to bring this line of the hair where the back hair, back facing hair meets the forward facing hairs of the brisket, they fail to bring it not just forward enough, but over enough, over onto the little stump of the foreleg. And when you do that, you're denying the mount a really what, what could be otherwise a very pretty little brisket area. Let me straighten this out. 
I'm going to bring the other side into position, then I'm going to show you how I trim the skin on the back of the brisket area. Okay, now here we have the, the cape, or shoulder area of the cape, well placed. I'm just going to simply press down into the brisket details. I'm going to continue to adjust the skin, make something nice out of this. Also, you can see right there, you see right there, you see the um, air pocket. Let me pop that. It's a hot pocket. Here we go. Here we are. There. Now, once the air is out of there, what I've done here, let me explain. I've brought the skin from the right side and the left side together up to form a bit of a peak. You can, you can leave it wide apart like this, if you like. I prefer to combine the skin on itself, and I get a much neater looking brisket. Plus, I've given myself more room to show the armpit or the front of the armpit detail. Now, go along and press this into the muscle structure on the lower neck and into the shoulders. And this will be gone over every day for about the first week. Pressing it down in contact. I used to line hide nails, 20 gauge hide nails, all down along the neck in all of these shallows and all of these depressions and into the details of the brisket. Now, until I get it stapled around the back, trimmed and stapled, I simply use one T-pin in the center, one T-pin up in the armpit where there's plenty of hair to disguise the hole that's being made, like so. And then I use a couple on the tips of the forelegs. Let me grab a couple here. And this is put here. Why? Simply to keep the skin from moving as I'm around back trimming it. And there are the pins put in place. See there, center in the brisket on the tips of the fronts, the, head, the heads of the, of the humerus. All my trimming is done with my paring knife, one of my paring knives. I just keep it good and sharp. Oh yeah, ouch. <laughs> First thing I do, the first thing I do, come in and I split the brisket in the center or the chest, the chest skin right down the center. Now I cut out a wedge. I go nearly up, nearly up to the, the baseboard. I definitely cut a wedge. When you cut a wedge out, you can bring the skin down straight and bring it together. Just like so, make a very neat appearance on the back. Same thing goes for the tips of the humerus. Both sides, like so. I 
All right. Again, I cut out, I cut away a wedge. What you do to one side, you repeat to the other. Or as they said in Gladiator, what we do in life echoes through eternity. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to grab my curved, my, my large curved scissors as soon as I find it right here. And with the curved side up, facing away from the back, I come in, I start trimming hair. Now, sure, the clients don't see it, but you know what? I know what's there. I know what's on the back of my mounts. Now, I'm going to put in my first couple of air staples. You see how neat that hide comes together? This is what you call neaterino. Now, I'm going to attach my first staples. as close to the edge of the backboard as I can. One. Two. And I go along, put a couple more in. There. Now, I'm going to trim more of the hideaway. But instead of cutting and slicing, I'm going to come along like so. Now, this knife is very, very, very sharp. I'm simply going to trace out where I want it to come away. And then, like so, remove it. This is the toughest skin you'll find on the mount. So, I'm going to take this Y cut that I made here. I'm going to try and eliminate some of the hair. Right here. Not going to get much of it off. Like so. Okay, I'm actually cutting away from some of the skin. Stretch that down. Staple it. So, that 
That'll be repeated on the other side as well. This is nice and neat. Now I come in. Going right here. Yeah, okay, that grabbed the skin. That's good. Right on the edge. And here, here, now as I go along, I take the knife and I start trimming it short. Pull this edge over, and when you fold it over, you will notice there's hair standing on end along the very, very, very edge. Take your scissors, I take my scissors, and I go in from there, and I just start shearing away hair. I want to get the heavy hair removed. I don't want him to be mine hairy. And hairy enough for all of us. Just like so. And you can see this little edge here is all that there is. That, that, that's the only edge that goes around the entire perimeter of the backboard for the deer. And again, I staple it as close to the edge as I can, keeping it, keeping the staples, I should say, going into the, the wood, the plywood backboard. And these Matuska forms, like, like many forms today, are made real well with a real good placement of the backboard. That's what I like about new form, of the new, a lot of the new forms. They're really manufactured well. Trim off a little more hair, hair in there. Now this flap of skin that's here will be removed with the knife, like so. Slice right down into it, pull it away. I'm going to even off the skin around the edge using the knife. giving a nice neat edge to the hide as I go. This will be done all the way around. This gets done to every deer, every time. No exceptions. Press down heavy on the knife blade. Slice along. Get as close to the staples as I can. Believe me, this is a lot easier when you're not trying to do it for the camera. <laughs> this goes so much smoother when the camera's eye is not on me and I'm trying to get a shot lined up. There we are. Now, there we go. That's a nice, neat back on a mount. Some folks don't care. I do. I know what it looks like. In fact, part of my finishing process, or I should say during the finishing process, this gets a piece of felt cut. 
and glued over the the bare plywood backboard. But that's just me. That's my modus operandi. I'm going to continue trimming, shearing the hair, and stapling all around the back of the deer. You all don't need to see that. All right, we're all stapled, trimmed, ready to rock and roll. Trim down with the knife, give a nice neat appearance. Like so. All right, the next thing to be done, <clears throat> pull the pins. Oh, hold that down. <laughs> okay. I'll pull the other pins in just a momentito frito. What I do now. I put cardboard around the back to give the hairs a little something to dry against. These staples are arrow half inch staples. Come in, making the hairs lay flat under the cardboard. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Doesn't matter if it's easy or not. Basically putting a wall behind the mount. So, have one more piece of cardboard and securing the back is complete. Like so. At this point, I'm just going to go along and brush the hair patterns in the chest. I want them to match up. Like so. Now there are little details the pectoral region. I'm going to press the hide into them, into close contact with them. Like so. Brushing the shoulders. And 
brushing the pattern, the hair, in a downward pattern. In other words, I'm not just going back, I'm coming at an angle toward the center of the neck. And when I stand the deer, turn the deer upright, stand him upright, the pattern will be coming from the back down. Right here on the shoulders, there's detail to be pressed into place. And I'm doing that as I go. Right now, we're going to bring them up. This is what I was talking about as far as in regards to brushing. It's coming down down. Not straight back, but down. If you've ever brushed a horse, for example, you'll notice, hopefully you'll notice, the directional growth of their coat. Well, a deer, the deer, the coat of a deer, moose, caribou, grows the same way was in a downward fashion. It doesn't grow straight back. That's why the mane on a horse, when it's allowed to grow out, the mane will flop and grow down one side or the other. Now here, I've got an air bubble, an air pocket, right under the skin on the cheek, right here. I want to eliminate that, but it's right here. I'm going to pop it. Make sure I get in between the hairs. I don't want to cut any of the hairs. Two holes, no waiting. Two holes, no waiting. One more for good measure. Now there's actually a jaw a, a jawline. You can actually make out the line of the jawbone under the lower mandibles, which is very correct. Plus, you'll only see it if the deer is hanging way up. But the fact that it's there means that it should be emphasized, not overemphasized. Just not overemphasized, but emphasized enough. Now I'm pressing the cape into tight contact with all of the muscular indentations, the little back of the jowls or the cheek. And this is what needs to be done over the course of a couple of days. I got a wider brush to take down the hairs in the proper place. Okay. All right, you little monkey. There we are. Pressing them into contact. This will be done every day. Pressing, them, pressing the cape into, into tight contact with the form and working out any air bubbles will be done every single day until the skin tells you, hey, I'm dry and I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the right place and you don't have to do this to me anymore. It will tell you. It will tell you. It will tell you. You just have to listen. tendency, as with all deer heads, is to use the antlers as a handle. Well, that's a wee bit of a problem with this soft little guy. Well, actually, they're not soft, but you, know, you don't want to yank the velvet off. 
So you have to be very, 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 very aware, very cognizant of the antlers and what you're doing around them. And you have to make sure you're not banging anything into them. Just going to go around the eyes one more time. Make sure the skin is all in the correct place and that it's tight. The eye skins are actually beginning to dry at this point. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and remove the plastic from over his head. And I'm going to start uh, fine-tuning him and tweaking him a little bit here and there. Come on, little man. Just get your hat off. There we go. Very nice. Oh, my goodness. It looks so pretty. <laughs> there we go. There's a big boy. All right, we're looking good there. You grab a pin. You can use a three-corner needle for adjusting the eyes. You can use a T-pin, whatever. As long as you can get in, hit the root, bring the feelers forward. My stronger glasses on here. With, with age come, comes wisdom and terrible eyesight. Ah, uh -uh. oh, look, there we are. Modeling tool. Brushes. Right. Bloody well right. Okay. I want to check the skin at the front crease of the eye. Make sure it's down tight. I want to check the skin entering into the lacrimal gland. Make sure it's pushed in. Bring the lacrimal gland over and down. Run my hand over the facial details. This is everyday stuff. For the first couple of days, this is what's needed. Now I've got a small brush here to go along with my wider brush. This is a little brush I picked up uh, from Matuska Supp Taxonomy Supply. It's a Kemper tool and it's real great for getting in and, and getting hair brushed where you don't want to use a big brush for fear of messing with the details or what have you. It also has a smaller end. This is the Kemper tools brush, double end brush I was talking about has a cone-shaped brush on one end and what looks like a little mascara brush on the other end. Now the nice thing is with this little mascara type brush you can get under your eyelashes and be sure you separate your eyelashes. You can actually brush the eyelashes. Make sure they're in the proper position. Works the same as using a needle tool or a pin on the feeler hairs. But yeah, it's like a mascara brush. Now, what I was doing before, now that we're in close-up, 
checking the placement of the front skin crease ahead of the eye. And putting it the bottom skin behind the lacrimal gland and pushing that skin forward and into the lacrimal gland. Then bringing the lacrimal gland down again tight with the modeling tool. See, the modeling tool, there's no give as there is with the finger. So if you use this to press against the clay, it will go a long way to flattening this detail. And you look at them from the front and that's all good. And the coolest thing about using the CA glue to adhere the nostrils to is that there's no need to plug the nostrils with paper or wads of plastic to make sure the skin stays down. Using the CA glue in the nose ensures that the skin will stay down. One thing you have to be careful of is that it will crystallize on the hairs. And that's where you have this little brush come in and help brush some of the crystallized hairs out of the nose completely. This can also scrub some of the glue off the hairs as you go in. And it will also pick out some of the clay, as you can see. That's what's happening here right now. We're getting some clay out of the nose that got onto the skin as we pressed the details of the skin down. And there we are. It's a little lovely nose detail, nostrils. Okay, I do this on this side here as well. Make sure the skin is still making tight contact where it needs to be. Get up under there with the modeling tool and check it from the other side with the light. We're doing good. Now at this point, I'll check how the bottom lid is drying. But I'm sorry. At this point, I'll check how the lower lip is drying. And this is drying nice. I'm going to push it, make sure it's pushed up. I'm going to push from the bottom of the lower lip. I want to push up on that. I want to re-emphasize the cleft down the center of the nose pad. Now, I also want to take the tip of this wooden tool and push in a bit on all of the little hair roots. I want to create little dimples in them. And this is better done the next day. Only because the clay has had a chance to set up overnight. I just want to create little dimples all around the nose pad, wherever there's a little white hair. <clears throat> also, at the back of the nose pad, where the bare skin meets the hair, where the bare skin meets the hair, I'd like to press in just a little and just emphasize that area between the two. Not a lot, just enough.
and I'm going to run my hand over it and gently even everything up. I'm going to do this on the other side as well. That's what having the clay under the nose pad area enables me to do. Now, he has a definite definition where the nose pad is located. Also, I'll go around the front edge of the nose pad and emphasize where the dark nose pad meets the hair. Again, on both sides. It's very, very subtle, but it will go a long way during the final finishing process. These are some of the little things I do on the second day. This is the second day of completing the mount. And let's adjust this lower eyelid here just a touch, just a touch. Be sure that the left eye matches the right eye. Okay, I gotta bring this eyelid down just a bit. I know you're not seeing what I'm doing, that's why I'm narrating it. Very nice. That's a beautiful match. Okay. Okay, you can accentuate this jowl, the masseter muscle here, just a wee bit, with pressure from the finger just ahead of it. You see there's a little bit of paste and air bubbles being pushed around. Go behind it to emphasize it. Like so. That really makes a difference in how it shows up. Now, I do this to every deer, not just deer with short coats. Okay? This hide does hold it in place. That's the neatest thing about this. Pro on hide paste. I can't say enough good about it. I cannot say enough good things about it. Let me straighten out the coat. And you can feel all the detail coming through. Actually, you can see it right here. You can even see the base of the facial vein coming through as I press. That's that little line that's appearing right here. Okay? That's part of the facial veining. It's showing up. Shows up even more in very short hair deer. Now that, if you want, you can emphasize a bit by building it up with some uh, uh, epoxy sculpt. But I wouldn't go overboard with it because unless a deer has been running for his life and gasping, you know, he's got his mouth open, tongue hanging out, that vein is not going to show a whole hell of a lot more than what it shows on the sculpture. And by simply working the skin every day, you can get those details to show. Now, I'm sure no one has ever thought of using a hammer to tweak things. But using my 3D reference, I can see where there are several areas I might want to tweak a little more than I have been, or than I have before at the front of the ear. Now right here, because the clay is beginning to set up nicely, we can reproduce this little divot right here. And the shape along the bottom, we can get that to match. Now I'm not just banging around, I'm tapping down and back, and I go around the back, I tap in and upward. Now, having that mashed around a bit, I can get in there with my fingers and further fine tune it, and tweak it, like so. 
And I've done I've done the same method. Or I say should use I should say use the same tool to accomplish this method at the back of the ear using the tack hammer. It's a light hammer. So you don't have to swing it mightily. You know, you're not a you're not the village smithy with arms like iron bands or Iron Man. Now we bring the coat into its correct brushing. We can come down the back. Bring the direction of the hair in the correct growth pattern. Correct growth pattern. While also running your hands over the details on the shoulders, pressing these features down tight where the front of the shoulder meets the base of the neck. We have a um, pocket here of either paste or air or both. Three little hits with the large three cornered needle and that's gone. Now what this is is paste that's rolling towards the back. I don't want it to roll completely out from under its place. I'm not making like a tube of toothpaste and trying to move the paste forward. But I am trying to get all the details secured where they belong. Without, I might add, the use of hide nails. I used to at one time, I was a big proponent of using hide nails. You had to be. The paste I had previously, and I, I, I do love the dextrin-based paste. I mean, it's inexpensive. But this may be a little pricier, but the results are that I have adhesion, skin to form adhesion like I've, I've never had before. And that to me is more important than just keeping a tradition alive for the sake of keeping a tradition alive. I'm going to continue working the ear base on the other side. But this is where I am on the second day. One of the things that takes place tweaking without the heavy handed use of a hammer is putting the wrinkles at the front of the ear. The ear base, I'm sorry, the ear butts. Now hold the ear from the back so that it this doesn't push it out of place. And you work the skin into wrinkles, which you can then you can then brush. If you wanted to overemphasize the wrinkles, you can add a little bit of hair setting gel and really push them into push the hair, that is, into the wrinkles that have been formed. And I can show I can show you that. If I can find my oh my hair setting gel is right here right in front of me. But you can go over and really press the hair 
or I should say, press the, the gel into the hair, then with the brush, go over and further press the hairs into the wrinkles using the brush. Now, after this dries, this will show even more than it's showing now. It's barely showing because once hair gets wet, of course, it's flattened. But yeah, there's wrinkles in the front of the ear, in front of the earbuds right now. If I create a shadow over them, oh, well, not so much. Well, we'll see it again when this deer gets finished, and this deer will be finished in a separate set of videos on camera. Okay. So does it for day one of the Woo. <laughs> so does it for day one of the tweaking process. Uh, he'll stay the entire day uh, just to the open air to dry a little slower. This evening, before I go to bed, I'll come down, put the plastic bag over him, and repeat everything I did here today, tomorrow. That will continue for two or three more days, I would say, until the skin has really begun to tighten up and dry up. So, everything is good. Just remember, when you go over the hide, pressing your hands against the hide, and you hear any little crackling sounds, that's a good bet that there are air bubbles under the skin in that location. And there's nothing better for killing air bubbles than a good three-cornered needle. Three-cornered needle is our friend. So, I'll let him continue to dry today. And um, I won't necessarily have to check back on him tomorrow on video unless something drastically happens like his ears fall off. But uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So, in the meantime, we'll see you on the flip side. Well, he's finished as far as the mounting goes. Now, over the course of the next couple of days, he'll be drying. Uh, I will constantly press the skin into the details on the mannequin, just as I'm doing here. Overnight, he will be bagged, unbagged tomorrow. Uh, his features refined. The earbuds shaped a little more. Check, make sure the eyes are drying properly. He needs to get checked over, all over. His skin is very, very thin in places, and he's a beautiful little buck. I know my client's going to be happy with him. Well, <clears throat> I hope this whole thing was educational for you. I hope it was entertaining, and I hope you got something out of it. So until the next time, adios amigos.